Um, good evening and welcome to um, the, the Macular Society, Macular and Me uh, webinar series again. Uh, so here we are, uh, another Thursday has rung around um, and uh, we're here with, uh, with Samantha Mann from um, St Thomas's who's going to talk about uh, diabetic eye disease this evening. Um, but for those of you who, who don't know me, just to start off with, uh, my name is Colin Daniels and I'm the uh, Macular Society Working Age and Young People Service Manager. Uh, and I, I've been with the society for oh, just like an age now. I think it's cruising on for nine years almost. Uh, and uh, we started these, um, you, know, you know, as a way of keeping patient information moving around when, uh, when we're all locked down in our homes. And here we are. So it's 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 fantastic. So um, the, all the other recordings are, are available on, on my YouTube and website uh, sort of going on, but I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, anyway, so um, as usual, uh, we, we have a speaker and, and, and um, who, who's going to talk about the, the subject for We Are, um, and then we're going to uh, then the chat will be open uh, with uh, where you can ask questions um, in in the old chat function there. So I'll, I'll make sure that's working properly in a minute. Um, so uh, with uh, so uh, just. Um, uh, so there'll be, a, an, as I say, there'll be an opportunity. I'm falling over my own teeth tonight. I'm really sorry. Uh, so there will be an opportunity at the end to, to talk to, uh, to Samantha through, through the chat. So um, keep your questions coming in if you've got any. And, uh, and uh, But I'm sure you will have. It's very interesting. Uh, um, Samantha has uh, very kindly talked before for us in our uh, annual conference a couple of years ago. And, uh, and it was it went down very well. So we thought we'd invite her back. Uh, so good evening, Samantha. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm fine. Thank you. Good evening. Good, good, excellent. All right. Well, I think I mean people hear enough from me, so uh, so why don't you uh, show your screen and and give us a give us a talk then, and we'll we'll, we'll all sit back and listen. With Lovely. You. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, so I just need to know whether that's. Oh, hang on. Yeah. There you go. Hopefully, yeah, people can see my slide. Where? Yeah. It's all shared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my name is Samantha Mann. I work as a consultant ophthalmologist at St Thomas's Hospital. I'm also um, the screening lead for our diabetic eye screening programme in South East London. And I'm going to be talking to you today about diabetes in your eyes, uh, current and future treatments. Uh, so, I, oh, just see if I get my next slide. Yeah. So um, I apologise for any of you who have heard me talk before. You might recognise a couple of the slides. Um, but I'll try and keep the content as up to date as possible, a bit more interesting as well. So as you know, diabetes causes many complications. These can be microvascular and macrovascular changes. Um, the macrovascular changes um, can lead to an increased risk of stroke and heart attack. And the microvascular changes tend to um, involve the organs of the body, including the kidneys, the feet, and the eyes. Um, and particularly in the eyes, um, you know, it causes retinopathy at the back of the eye, which is what I'm going to be concentrating on today. Uh, but it can increase the risk of cataract, which comes on a bit earlier, and can also increase the risk of glaucoma in some circumstances. So moving on, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, in a lot in the, uh, in the press about prevention of diabetes. It seems to be um, quite an important topic at the moment um, in type 2. And it's more, more to do with uh, putting type 2 diabetes uh, in remission or rever trying to reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, and a lot of, of this um, is based on work from Professor Roy Taylor uh, from Newcastle and his direct trial. Um, he's also written a book about life without diabetes. Um, and it's predominantly looking at ways of trying to put diabetes in remission. Um, he believes very strongly that um, patients with diabetes have, uh, from his research, has been shown that uh, there's an e excess of fat inside the liver and inside the pancreas. Uh, and by uh, limiting the diet, particularly, I mean, it's a, quite a tall ask, I think, to expect people to be on a diet of 800 calories a day. But they, he's shown that um, being on this diet can you know, reduce the amount of fat, fat in, increase inside the liver and the pancreas and can put type 2 diabetes in remission. Um, but um, having said this, I, I mean, it's, it, a lot of work is going on at the moment about this. Um, and there's a lot of books around, um, including Professor Taylor's book, trying to, to, to get patients uh, more interested to, to, to try to put their diabetes in remission. And that can, I mean, can certainly can help uh, to reduce risks of retinopathy as well. But 
what we're talking about mainly is uh, today is about the way that the uh, diabetes does affect the eye and we know that 5 million people now are living with diabetes in the UK and this is predicted to increase to about 5.5 million by 2030. Uh, we know that there are two main types of diabetes. Um, there's a type one uh, where you can't make your own insulin at all and this, is, this corresponds to about 8% of the diabetes population. And then there's type two, which is about 90% uh, when the insulin you produce is less effective or you can't produce enough of it. Um, we know that from studies that in patients with type one diabetes, um, about one in two will have some level of retinopathy um, at some point, and in type two diabetes, about one in three will have some levels of retinopathy. Now, do remember that most of these levels of retinopathy are not serious or sight threatening, um, and can be. Uh, and many of these treat forms can be treated now. There are also rarer forms of diabetes, um, or can be steroid induced or gestational, and um, other other types as well that make up about two percent of the population. And just a note of gestational diabetes can occur in pregnancy, but this does not require any eye screening because it does not cause any uh, retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy, um, one of the good things that has happened over the last few years is, is no longer the leading cause of blindness in the working age population. Uh, and the, the main factors behind this have been mainly the diabetic eye screening program and the success of that. Uh, and also imp improved blood sugar control with better treatments on the market as well. Um, and we have better treatments uh, in the eye clinic. Uh, remember that most patients uh, with diabetes have, um, or most people with diabetes have non-site threatening levels of retinopathy. Um, and it's only a small proportion that develop the site threatening types. It is still, however, a cause of visual problems if left untreated or if it's progressive uh, at the back of the eye. So just moving on to say, how is the eye affected by diabetes, we tend to divide it up into two different uh, stages. There's the retinopathy um, part, which is really what we look for around the edge of the retina, the back of the eye. Uh, and then there's the maculopathy, which is the central part of the back of the eye. The, the retinopathy is, is predominantly based to change uh, due to changes of the blood vessels at the back of the eye and reduced blood flow, uh, and what we call ischemia, because the blood flow is reduced at the back of the eye, um, which causes a chemical. Um, caused, uh, called vascular endothelial growth factor. Well, there's a number of factors uh, are released, but particularly the VEGF is released at the back of the eye, which results in hemorrhaging, um, cotton wool spots, we call them at the back of the eye, and new blood vessels or abnormal blood vessels to grow on the retina. Uh, and this can certainly cause problems with bleeding. Um, and then the second thing we look for um, is what we call maculopathy. And this is really when we, we have, um, we see blood vessels um, have, that form little outpouchings of the blood vessel walls. You can see the diagram down in the left-hand side there. There's a little outpouching called a microaneurysm, and that can result in leakage um, of fluid um, into the retina uh, and uh, in the central area uh, called maculopathy. And that leakage tends to show itself uh, with little um, yellow deposits around an area of leakage, and that we call those exudates. Uh, and they can show us that there is some maculopathy um, occurring in the retina. Uh, both, of, both of these can be treated, and I'll be talking more about that shortly. Um, the problem with diabetic retinopathy is that it is a progressive condition. Um, and unfortunately, you don't get any symptoms from the retinopathy until very late stages. So patients can actually have, or patients, uh, so people with diabetes can have quite extensive changes at the back of the eye right the way through to quite advanced what we call proliferation of new blood vessels at the back of the eye, um, or R3 in our, in our language, um, and you can have no symptoms at all. And then it's only if some of these abnormal blood vessels will then bleed, bleed into the back of the eye, bleed into the gel, uh, and cause a vitreous hemorrhage, and that's when it would cause symptoms of blurring of vision. So the problem with diabetes is that it can you know, be quite significant changes at the back of the eye. No, you wouldn't know about it unless you had your diabetic eye screening check or eye check in the clinic, um, and then it could be diagnosed. And then the late stages obviously can, can lead to visual problems, blurring and visual loss if there's a large bleed into the back of the eye. Um, what about the maculopathy that we mentioned? So the maculopathy, um, as a, can also be asymptomatic or no, no symptoms in the early stages, um, but it can also cause blur, visual blurring, 
um, once it gets more central at the back of the eye. Uh, and it can occur at any stage of the retinopathy. So if you have early retinopathy, you can have maculopathy. And if you have late stage retinopathy, you could also have maculopathy. And these are some pictures that we um, can see at the back of the eye, just showing what maculopathy looks like. Uh, in the first diagram, we just have a single exudate, a yellow spot at the back of the eye. That shows there's a tiny bit of leakage there. And as it, it and you get more extensive leakage, um, again, if it's just to the side, um, just off the centre, uh, away from the centre of the macula, uh, it, again, it wouldn't cause any symptoms, but we would normally want to treat that with laser treatment. And if it's more extensive at the back of the eye um, and, and starting to cause blurring of vision uh, as well, then we might want to consider uh, injection treatment or other treatments. Uh, how else do we access the eye uh, in the clinic? Well, we tend to use a scanner. It's called an OCT scan. Um, many of you might have had a scan before, or if anyone comes comes to the eye clinic regularly, may have had a scan before. It's a very straightforward thing to have done. It's a bit like a photograph at the back of the eye, and it shows us exactly where the swelling is at the back of the eye in, in what we call maculopathy. And this um, OCT scan shows quite nicely the red patch there, um, just off to the centre, off the centre, that's the centre of the back of the eye, the fovea, and just off to the side, there's an area of swelling here, and that's what we call diabetic maculopathy. Um, and that, um, you know, although it wouldn't necessarily cause a problem with the vision, it could potentially cause problems with the vision if it were to spread into the centre. So we would often want to treat this area of swelling, and it's nicely shown up on the OCT scan um, for us to be able to treat it. So we talked about the, the nature of diabetic retinopathy. The problem is you don't get symptoms until quite late um, in the disease process. And that's why diabetic eye screening is so important. An annual eye screen in your diabetic eye screening program, or if you're under the eye clinic, um, you know, to see, to check the, the changes are, is very important. And then if we do, if they do notice any changes on the um, on the retinal photographs, then you'll be referred to the hospital eye service for any for treatment so that we can carry it out before there's the risk of any sight loss. Eye screening is different to your local um, optometry check or optometrist check because the optometry um, optometrist will look for um, the general health of the eye, will check for conditions like glaucoma or high pressure in the eye, will also check for glasses, can also check for macular degeneration and things like that, but they won't necessarily be trained in how to recognize all the different features in diabetes. Um, whereas if you have your diabetic eye screening checked then the team looking at your photographs will be will be trained specifically to look for diabetic uh, changes and will be able to refer you if you need to be seen in the eye clinic. Um, I've talked before I know about uh, risk factors for progression, but um, they haven't changed very much. They still seem to be um, pretty much um, the same. There's what we call the non-modifiable risk factors, the type of diabetes you have, the duration of diabetes is very important, age and ethnicity. And then there's the non modifiable, sorry, the modifiable ones glucose control, blood pressure control, lipid or cholesterol um, levels, pregnancy, and non attendance, uh, I put on there as well, which is quite important. When we look at age, um, we know that, um, that diabetic retinopathy tends to affect younger patients more than the older patients. And it tends to be um, you know, the ones that need. Um, uh, these are, these are, this is a graph showing the number of patients that need routine and urgent referrals to the hospital eye service. This is from our screening program. And you can see that the highest bars are in the lower age groups, the 20 to 24, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, 35 to 39. So these are the ones that need the highest amount of referrals into the eye service. Um, and that's the routine referrals, the, the, the green bars. And then the dark uh, sort of black bars are the urgent referrals. Uh, to the eye clinic from the diabetic eye screening program. And again, you can see it's the younger age group, the 25 to 29, the 30 to 34, and 35 to 39 that need, to, and the 40s that need the more, more referrals for urgent um, pathology. Um, so it does tend to you know, cause more problems in the younger patients rather than the older patients. Um, moving on to ethnicity. Um, it is important to know that you know to note what the ethnicity is because there is a difference. Um, we we certainly see uh, up to three times more um, maculopathy requiring laser in the Afro-Caribbean group 
um, compared to Caucasian individuals and with site threatening retinopathy you're twice as likely to have site threatening retinopathy in the African Arabian population compared to Caucasian and some of this might be genetic and some of it might be relating to kidney disease associated kidney disease or it might be late presentation or it could be a, a whole host of factors we don't fully understand this yet we know that glucose control is really important um, we know that the higher the HbA1c the risk of worsening of Retinopathy is significant. Um, you know, it, this is an old study now, but the old study showed that you get a 75% reduction in developing retinopathy and a 50% reduction um, in progression of retinopathy by keeping the HbA1c lower than 7% or lower than 53 millimoles per mole. Um, uh, having on the on the counter on side to this, it's important not to bring the sugar down sugar down too quickly because we know that if the if the if this HbA1c is brought down too quickly that can cause a, a risk of worsening of retinopathy as well but as long as it's met, managed appropriately and, and checked in the eye clinic we can usually circumvent any problems there. Pregnancy we know can accelerate the course of diabetes, uh, diabetic retinopathy especially type 1 patients. Um, the most important factors seem to be the retinal um, retinopathy levels at conception uh, and also the duration of diabetes prior to pregnancy. So we know that if, um, if women have um, progressed uh, for more than 15 had more than 15 years of diabetes, then they're much more likely to progress during pregnancy. Um, and we know that NICE recommends um, screening at least two to three times in your pregnancy. If you don't have any retinopathy, then you only need to be seen twice in pregnancy. But if you do have retinopathy, then you may need to be seen three times during your pregnancy. It is safe to put drops in. Um, if you're pregnant, and it's also safe to have laser treatment in pregnancy, completely um, where there's no risk at all, no side effects from uh, on the pregnancy at all. But you can't have what we call injection injection treatments if you are pregnant. Um, certainly not the um, anti VEGF ones. They, they would they wouldn't be considered safe in that in that um, uh, in that uh, circumstance. So I mentioned non-attendance being an important factor. We did um, some research on our uh, population in, in Southeast London about non-attendance, and we showed that patient, uh, people who missed two years of screening um, before they attended um, had a 10 times more risk, a higher risk of needing to be referred to the hospital uh, than those that didn't miss two years of screening. So we know that um, you know, missing screening appointments is, is important, is, is dangerous for the eyes. Um, and this is an example of uh, this graph, sorry, shows us what the uptake is like um, against age. So how many people attend for their diabetic eye screening program according to their age group? And we can see from this that when patients are young, so between 12 and 15 years old, usually brought by their parents, um, the, the attendance is good, but it does drop off, um, usually sort of the teens and tw early 20s, possibly when um, a lot of uh, patients with diabetes have gone, moved to universities or moved away from home. It might um, it's much more difficult when you're working, obviously, to attend these appointments. Uh, life gets in the way, uh, and then then the attendance does increase again from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and goes up again. But it it is difficult to get young young people to attend for appointments. But we know that and that can be uh, cause an increased risk of retinopathy if if patients don't attend on a, a number of occasions. So what about treatments? We're talking about treatments now, um, I'll talk briefly about the Moonshot project. I don't know whether, I don't know much about that, but that is something I learned about recently at a uh, recent conference in Hamburg. And then I'll talk about currently used, current used treatments for retinopathy, currently used treatments for maculopathy, and then potential new treatments as well. So the Moonshot initiative um, is, uh, has been led by the um, JDRF. Um, um, and it's mainly about trying to, um, it's research uh, looking at improving vision in diabetes. There isn't a lot of um, treatments at the moment that can improve vision significantly, although some of the anti-VEGF injections do do that, but um, they're trying to basically, uh, the reason why it's called a moonshot is because they're trying to achieve the impossible um, and trying to um, lead on a whole new um, set of research that will help to restore vision uh, in people with diabetes. And, and that sounds quite exciting, um, and I think it's, it's, it's led by um, the JDRF with um, Mary Tyler Moore's husband, Robert Levine, um, uh, behind that. So that's, that sounds quite exciting. I don't know a lot about it, but it is something that sounds quite exciting. Um, so current treatment options for diabetic retinopathy. We, now, this is retinopathy I'm going to talk about now. Um, this is when you get the new blood vessels growing on the retina and evidence of um, a reduction in the blood flow. So the main 
uh, four treatments here I'm going to talk about systemic control, laser, laser treatment, anti-VEGF injection treatment and vitrectomy surgery, which is much rarer to need that, but I'll talk briefly about that. Systemic controls, we know that the early stages of retinopathy are reversible, uh, if we can catch them early enough. But once you get to the advanced stage and the proliferative changes, then it, unfortunately it's very unlikely that these will, will reverse um, just with systemic control. Um, but it certainly can help. And we know that good glucose control, blood pressure control is really important as well, because that can worsen retinopathy. And we'd always ask for it to be aim the blood pressure to be 100, 130 over 80 or less. And we know that cholesterol can also reduce, um, patrolling cholesterol can also reduce the risk of retinopathy progression. And that's from the field and the ACCORD studies. Moving on, um, so laser treatment is still very important on the, in the treatment of um, what we call proliferative retinopathy or R3 um, retinopathy. And that's when blood vessels start to grow on the retina in the wrong place. And these blood vessels tend to be very fragile, very delicate, and they grow on the surface of the retina and can bleed into the gel of the eye, causing um, loss of vision, because it can cause severe loss of vision. Um, we know that, um, that pan-retinal laser, the PRP laser, can reduce this risk of severe vision loss by about 50% uh, as opposed to you know, untreated eyes. And we know that the greatest benefit is uh, seen in those patients who have what we call the high risk abnormal blood vessels or the high risk um, R3 or proliferative retinopathy. And that study was I know, for over five years. And we, we do the laser treatment to try to prevent bleeding of these abnormal blood vessels, which can, you know, can cause bleeding if, if just left. The pan-retinal laser treatment, um, I know it, it, people don't like the idea of having laser treatment. Um, it is a very effective treatment. It's a long-term treatment. It's a permanent treatment. I like to describe it as an insurance policy for the eye to help the eye protect the eye against problems in the future. Um, and the trouble is if you do the laser, if you catch the blood vessels early, then you can laser them and they respond much, much better. But if you leave the um, laser and you do the laser very late, once, once blood bleeding has occurred, it's much more difficult to laser at that stage and the laser is less likely to work. Um, and it's more likely that you're gonna need um, a vitrectomy operation if you try to do the laser too late. Um, just talking a bit more about the laser, we, uh, what does PRP laser involve? Um, we uh, is really treating the edge of the retina, the, the, the re area of the retina that doesn't have a very good blood supply. We're treating those, that area. It's an outpatient appointment. Um, we do a vision check, put dilating drops in, we, drop the, um, we numb the, the um, uh, eye. We put a special lens on the eye to stop you blinking. The laser machine like, acts like a, a camera with a bright flash. Uh, it takes about 15, 20 minutes or so per eye sometimes. You might not need both eyes done at the same time. Sometimes it's just the one eye that needs lasering. And it's just, you do sometimes just get a slight twinge in the eye. Some people feel more discomfort than others um, with the pan-retinal laser, but it, it's usually uh, once the treatment's done, um, you know, after two or three treatments, usually that, that eye has been lasered and, and it acts as an insurance policy to reduce the risk of further bleeding. Uh, but it can be, sometimes it does need to be repeated a few times. Um, moving on to anti-VEGF injections for the um, R3. Now, this is the, again, this proliferative retinopathy I was telling you about. We don't use anti-VEGF injections currently for these, um, this proliferative retinopathy. It's not yet NICE approved. Um, I know that there, there have been studies in America and the UK called the Clarity Study and the Protocol S Study. These studies have shown that the anti-VEGF injections can reduce the blood vessel growth and can reduce the sort of sight loss uh, in, the, in the peripheral field uh, of vision, um, and they can um, you know, reduce the need for surgery. But the problem with these treatments is that you need to keep going with the injections. You need to give the injections ongoing, you know, one to three monthly. Um, it's a massive cost burden, treatment burden, regular treatments with possible increased risk of infections as well. And the trouble is if you don't, if you suddenly stop attending for these injection treatments, then you, could, you can do even worse because, um, you know, patients, there has been studies showing a worse outcome in people who've like, not continued with their injection treatment or have not attended for some reason. So it is potentially um, a, a, a treatment that maybe we may, may see more of in the future, but at the moment it's not recommended as a, a routine treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's the R3. What about surgery, um, vitrectomy surgery? Now, we only use vitrectomy surgery in very advanced cases of um, diabetic retinopathy when there's a lot of bleeding or fibrosis or scarring. And this is, uh, this is rare. Um, 
this is sadly a patient, a 21 year old patient of mine who had diabetes from the age of two, had floaters and reduced vision. And she'd really, really struggled with her diabetes for several years, especially all through COVID. Um, and she had quite a lot of bleeding and quite a lot of pulling and, um, on the retina and scarring on the retina. Um, she required retrectomy surgery and laser, which really did help restore her sight. So she, although she was doing quite badly initially after COVID, um, she didn't, she didn't have very good vision and had a lot of bleeding in the eyes. Um, she actually recovered a lot of vision and was is do, actually doing very well now. So the surgery actually worked really well for her. So moving on now uh, to talk about um, maculopathy. We've talked a bit about the retinopathy, but this is maculopathy now, um, and we're just just going to be talking a bit about this. So there's um, five different tr main treatments um, that I'll be mentioning. So we mentioned about the systemic control, and that again is important. Um, the early stages, uh, again, are reversible uh, with good, good control. Once the um, maculopathy is more extensive, it is harder to, to, to reverse. But there is a study called the Protocol V, um, which was a few years ago now, but um, talked about observation. So in early, early cases of, of maculopathy, when there's not much change in vision, when there's just a few little exudates around, it is actually quite safe to just wait and watch uh, and not need to rush in with a laser and not need to rush in with injection treatment because patients can do just as well uh, observing them for, the, for, for two years. And you only need to start uh, further treatments if the vision drops or if the um, maculopathy gets worse. Uh, but you can just observe patients in the in the early stages. What about the Cleopatra trial? Now, this is an in, was an interesting trial a few years ago, um, led by Shoba Siva Prasad, uh, who's an amazing um, researcher in diabetes and well, in general medical conditions. She's um, amazing, and she was uh, she talked in Hamburg as well recently. The Cleopatra trial was looking at light masks, uh, wearing them at night time to reduce the risk of any maculopathy. Now, it's believed that um, patients who, uh, in the night time your, your retina is more metabolically active, and it was thought that that might um, lead to more oxygen demand at night, and it might be the reason why people get maculopathy. And by wearing these special light masks, it was thought that you had to wear them all night. They were shining a bright light into the eye all night, um, over the, through the lids, and it was thought that might reduce the levels of maculopathy. Um, but unfortunately, the, the trial didn't work, um, did not show any benefit from, um, from having this trial, um, these masks, and, and so it's, it's been abandoned now. Uh, we still use focal laser treatment for maculopathy when it's not uh, involving the centre of the back of the eye. So we, um, this is another example. So you've seen this diagram again um, previously. Um, there's an area of swelling away from the centre. So the centre of the grid is the, what we call the fovea. And this little area of swelling is just away from that. And that responds really well to laser treatment. And this is another patient who had laser treatment in a small area of swelling away from the centre. Uh, pre-laser and then post-laser, that settled down really nicely. So laser treatment can work very well if there's an area of swelling away from the center of the fovea. Um, the laser treatment is done very much the same way as the other laser, uh, the pan-retinal laser, but it's much quicker than the pan-retinal laser and much less uncomfortable. Um, if we do move on now to the, to the injection treatments, um, some patients um, do have injection treatments for, for macular degeneration and for other conditions, but we do use them in diabetes as well. And it's mainly when there's a lot of swelling at the back of the eye. In the, um, so someone who has quite severe maculopathy, swelling in the centre part of the back of the eye, causing a reduction of vision. Um, and that's when um, the, laser, the, the injection treatment works the best. Um, the macular area has to also be swollen to more than 400 microns uh, to benefit and that's when it's uh, nice nice would recommend the treatment started uh, and again it is it does involve monthly injection treatments um, we use medications including ranibizumab and blibercept and um, there's a new one coming up called verizumab now and that unfortunately they do have to be given monthly initially but then after a few months um, usually what happens is the frequency goes down but they do work very well at reversing the maculopathy and can also slow down the retinopathy uh, as well. Um, anti VEGF treatments, as I mentioned, the ILEA and Lucentis are the commonest ones we use and they block the VEGF and they stop the leakage at the back of the eye. They also can block the abnormal blood vessels growing and can improve vision. Um, but they do need to be given quite for quite significant amount of time initially for the first five to six months and then ongoing maybe less frequently for a, a good a number of often number of years 
We also use steroids sometimes. Um, you, uh, there's a steroid injection called, uh, I, uh, it's called Ozodex um, or Ilevian. There's a longer lasting one. And these are anti-inflammatory. Um, they can also help to improve vision. And we do use them in diabetes sometimes, but they can cause an increase in eye pressure and can cause cataract. Um, hence, we can only use them in patients who've had cataract surgery already. Um, they do need to be given three to four monthly. Um, and we tend to use them if patients are unresponsive to the anti-VEGF treatments, and then we would use the steroid Ozodex injections as well. Again, they can be given um, into the eye. The injection sounds awful, uh, but most of our patients tolerate them extremely well, uh, and they do keep coming back for more injections because they really work and they can improve the vision uh, and, and, they, and they can reduce the amount of swelling at the back of the eye and are very effective treatments. This is an example of someone who's had a bit of swelling. You can see the top diagram showing quite a lot of swelling, the red and the white area, a bit like snow on a mountain. Um, so the sweat central um, macular area is swollen up to 513 in, on that di top um, diagram. And once they'd had six injections of the aflibercept, the retina was back to how it should be, almost normal. Uh, the thickness has gone down to 243 and, and there's no red or white area anymore on that, on that map there, uh, showing how effective these treatments can be. Um, this is another one with a steroid implant. Um, you can see the photo on the left shows a very swollen retina, uh, very uh, lots of cysts and swelling, and the thickness was 574 microns. And after the Ozodex or steroid implant, um, the vision uh, improved and the uh, swelling went right down to 183. So it does, does work quite well. Um, the pressure went up a bit, so we did need to start some anti-pressure drops as well. Um, but the Unfortunately, these treatments do need to be repeated because they don't last that long in the eye. What does injection treatment involve? Again, it's an outpatient appointment. We check the vision, dilating drops, and we numb the uh, drops, um, uh, numb the eye with drops. We use a special drape and a clip to stop the eye blinking, uh, keep it all sterile. And it's a very quick injection into the eye with a bit of a pressure sensation, but it's not usually too painful. Um, although it sounds, sounds it, it's not actually that, that uncomfortable. And the eye often feels a bit gritty uh, for about 24 hours afterwards. Um, in, these do need to be repeated monthly for at least four to six months and then less frequently after that. Uh, and they may need long-term treatment just depending on how, how the response is. But you can reduce the amount of retinopathy um, by about two steps in the back of the eye by using these treatments as well. Vitrectomy surgery again um, is only used for very advanced cases if there's a lot of uh, pulling uh, on the retina then sometimes surgery can be beneficial, but we don't tend to use surgery very often for, for maculopathy in diabetes. So what about newer treatments? Um, just a quick whistle stop tour for these. There are newer injection treatments. Verizumab you might've heard of. Um, it's a new drug called Vivizmo. Um, it has the potential to last much longer than the current treatments. So instead of only being lasting one month or two months, it might actually last up to four months uh, in between treatments. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the port delivery system, a, bit, a little bit about gene therapy, and another study um, that's going on about uh, diabetic eye uh, drops for diabetic macular edema. Um, the Frizumab drug is very similar to the uh, Flimbercept, but it's actually um, has two arms. So the antibody, it's an antibody again, and it has two arms. One's a, um, an anti, what's called an anti ang 2 uh, and the other one, sorry, and the other one is an anti VEGF. They're just two molecules joined together, which have a, uh, seems to have a much stronger effect. Uh, and these two trials, Yosemite and Ryan trials, have just been shown the results recently to be very, very favorable. And it seems like patients can go up to 12 weeks or even up to 16 weeks between injections, much longer than, the, than uh, we're getting at the moment with the uh, Flibercept um, injections. Um, the, the, the retina seems to be dried out much better with this Verizumab. Um, and although we don't have long-term data, we only have two-year data at the moment, but it, it does seem to be a very safe drug to give and does seem to work much better, much longer, much, for much longer than the current treatment. So it's quite exciting and we're due to start using these medications quite soon because they're now nice approved. What about the port delivery system? This is something you might have heard about. Um, it's a, um, we haven't started using it much in the UK yet, although some centres might be using them. It's a little implant, a bit like a rice grain that has to be put into the eye. It's like a little implant, and then it needs to be filled up intermittently every six months with the, with the ranibizumab drug. Um, I mean, it, it is something, obviously, that has to go into the eye. It has to have a little mini operation to have that put in. Um, 
It's used mainly for macular degeneration, not so much of diabetes, really. Uh, di macular degeneration, uh, some patients have had this. Um, there were a few problems initially with putting this implant in, but some patients seem to really like it and it seems to work quite well. But it's still early days and I, it hasn't really been adopted for diabetes really yet, although um, they are looking to, to move it into the diabetes field um, side of things. So because it has had some success in, in macular degeneration. Um, it's still the same drug. It's still Lucentis that has to be injected in, to put into it, filled up uh, every six months or so. Uh, gene therapy is quite exciting. I mean, it's still very, very early days, but some of the studies have looked at gene therapy, injecting a small um, amount of a, a gene under the retina um, with a micro injector to potentially provide a continuous supply of this anti-VEGF um, treatment. So instead of having to have monthly injections, you might be able to put this little um, gene in under the retina and then it and then it'll just stay there and produce anti-VEGF uh, anti constantly in the eye. Uh, and it seems to be very well tolerated in the first 15 people in this trial. Um, they looked at safety and looked at um, progression of diabetes and it, do it does seem to be working quite well, although it's still very early days um, and we still don't know enough about gene therapy, but it, it, seem, it, it certainly is promising. The Diamond study also is a, a new study looking at this um, dexamethasone eye drop. It's basically a steroid eye drop that you put into the eye to see if it can help uh, with diabetic uh, macula maculopathy. I mean, it's still um, undergoing tri uh, trials and they do look favorable, um, although it's difficult to know how long, you know, you might have to continue to use the drop forever. Uh, and the danger is that does, will it increase the pressure in the eye? Because we know steroids can uh, cause cataract and can cause pressure rise. So whether that will be uh, a problem in the future uh, is yet to see, but that's a Swiss group looking at that. So in summary, um, you can have severe retinopathy at the back of your eye without any symptoms. That's why it's important to have a, a yearly diabetic check at your diabetic eye screening program or um, in your eye clinic if you're seeing the eye clinic. Uh, just because you have retinopathy or maculopathy does not mean that you need to have treatment. Um, often observation and just observed um, increased, improved, sorry, glucose or blood pressure or cholesterol control is all that's required. But if you do need treatment, um, laser and injection treatments are very effective and they often work um, very well and are already available now with nice approval um, and very, very rarely surgery is needed. That's, that's pretty rare to need an operation, um, but the operations can be very successful. Treatments are improving all the time and new trials are promising for drugs um, that last longer and can reduce the levels of retinopathy and maculopathy. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Oh well, thank you very much, Samantha. That was uh, that was cool. Uh, very very informative as always. Uh, lots and lots of info. Uh, mm. So thanks very much. Uh, sorry about the delay on the uh, on the chat. Uh, uh, Jerry finally uh, managed to get uh, into the back and, and, and fix it. So uh, welcome, Jerry. Um, Hi. Hi. <laughs> Did we, did we get anything through the chat, uh, Joe? I know we had one question from Bernie. But, uh... We had one question about anti-VEGF, but, but answered uh, during the course of the, of the talk. Um, and we've got one um, about macular, macular ischemia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I think yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, um, that's true. Please, that's true. Yeah. Please, can you explain yeah. what this is and is there any treatment planned for the future? Yeah. Okay. So, yes. Sorry, I didn't mention macular ischemia. Macular ischemia is effectively where the blood supply has failed um, at the very centre of the back of the eye. And it usually is a result of um, having diabetes for a long time. Um, it, unfortunately, it doesn't have a treatment because at the moment there is no way of increasing the uh, perfusion or the blood supply at the back of the eye. Once the um, once it, that has occurred, um, it generally means that there's not enough blood supply getting to that part of the very central part of the back of the eye. Um, the cells are not able to get enough um, oxygen or um, nutrients, and that area of the retina cannot see. Uh, the, it's usually the very central part of the back of the eye, the macula. Um, and as I said, even though all of the anti-VEGF trials and other trials have looked at trying to, uh, to see if the, these treatments can increase the blood supply, at the back of the eye, none of the treatments have been able to do that. So it's, it's unfortunately, it's a, it's a chronic side effect for patients, some patients who have a very, um, almost like a very severe type of diabetes that where they just have, uh, the blood supply is a problem. Um, 
and you know unfortunately not treatable at this stage but it can it doesn't just happen in diabetes it, it does also happen in vein occlusions some patients have um, blockages of veins at the back of the eye and that causes a severe reduction in blood supply as well um, but you can't predict who gets the ischemia and who doesn't um, and you know sometimes it happens you know later on in in the disease process sometimes it happens uh, early on but it, you can't really predict who's going to get the maculopathy the macular ischemia and who who is isn't I don't know if that answers the question fully, but <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and another question is: Can you have retinopathy and not have maculopathy, and vice versa? And can you yeah. have both? Ah, uh, yes. So you can definitely have both. Um, in fact, most patients have both. Um, you can have um, you can have retinopathy and no maculopathy. So that's that's also quite common. A lot of our type one patients have retinopathy. Um, so they can get R1 level or R2 level or R3 level, and you can get no maculopathy at all. So that's quite common, particularly in type 1 patients. Um, you can't get it the other way around. So you can't have maculopathy and no retinopathy, because as soon as you have any degree of maculopathy, you've automatically got retinopathy as well. So you can't, yeah, you can't have maculopathy and no retinopathy, but you can have it the other way around. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've got one or two. Um, did, did you did I miss it or did you mention bolizumab? Oh, so no, you're right. I didn't mention Bayview. Uh, Bayview uh, bolizumab is um, another drug that is available and it is certainly has been has been used in age age related macular degeneration. We have concerns about Bayview just because with the macular degeneration studies there were cases, uh, not many, but there were a few cases of uh, what we call vasculitis where. There was um, it was called an occlusive vasculitis where there was um, a very severe loss of vision from um, a very severe infl inflammatory process at the back of the eye. And it wasn't many cases, but the American Academy did uh, put out um, you know, um, a warning about the Bayview when it was first released for macular degeneration. Um, and so we're very, very cautious about using Bayview just for the, the concern. I mean, it's, it's only likely to be very small amount of cases, but um, the risk of severe sight loss with this retinal vasculitis uh, could be severe and um, we're just a little bit nervous about using it so we haven't used it uh, certainly in our center but some places are using it because it does last longer than the current um, uh, flibercept and lucentis but with the verizumab coming through there have been no reports of the vasculitis from the but I, I agree we haven't used it very much yet but there haven't been any reports of, of the occlusive vasculitis with the uh, verbismo and the frismab so we're just keener to use that one because it might mean the patients can get to three or four months between the injections rather than one to two months that we're getting at the moment thank you yes that, that's been my general impression for map was probably going to out, out compete for map. yeah yeah i think so thank you um, uh, no more questions. I've got, but I, I've got another one. Um, I suppose it strikes me that um, there's a lot of different types of treatment for this condition and lo lots of options, I suppose. How do the ophthalmologists decide ab above and beyond nice guidance and, and things like that, how to treat a person? Is it very much experience or is there guidance? Or Yeah, I mean, it, it is does come from experience, but there is um yeah, there are those guidance. I mean, the, the Royal College has published a really good um, uh, diabetic retinopathy protocol uh, recently. Um, but it does depend on very much on what the combination of, of signs are. So if we see lots of retinopathy um, and lots of maculopathy, um, then most then we would probably prefer to use a combination of laser and anti VEGF injections. If you just see predominantly the maculopathy, we tend to the first line is always as the anti VEGF treatments because they seem to be the most effective. Um, and then there are some cases, some patients that can't have the anti VEGF, um, or if they were worried about, um, if we're worried about them not being able to attend on a monthly basis, or they have a very high um, risk of had a recent heart attack or recent stroke we wouldn't wouldn't normally start someone on an anti-VEGF treatment we would want to use a steroid one instead so there are certain rules that we follow to, to decide which treatment is the best um, to go for but it, a lot of patients need a combination of treatments it, as you said there's lots of treatments out there and sometimes a combination works better but laser and a bit of laser and a bit of injection and a bit of you know um, steroid sometimes if someone's going away for three months uh, holiday and then they, they have a steroid one instead. So it, it, it does vary according to very much according to the patient. 
Thank you. Um, another question's just come in. Um, some people have antibiotics. Another one's coming. Some people have antibiotic eye drops to use after injections and some are not given them. Why would that be, please? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we used to use antibiotic drops a lot um, with all our patients, but actually the evidence base has not has shown that it doesn't reduce the risk of endophthalmitis. So we worry, the thing we, reason why we give antibiotics is because um, we worry about infection and in endophthalmitis is a severe infection that you can get after an injection. It is rare, so one in a thousand cases, but if it does happen, it can affect the vision permanently. So we always worry about it. But the evidence base showed that the anti antibiotics did not prevent and, uh, endophthalmitis, and it actually caused more in increased resistance uh, to the antibiotic. Um, and it's, uh, it, it was actually the college that recommended that they were no longer given out, um, the Royal College uh, suggested it no longer given out uh, routinely. So I think some centers do still use it, um, but we've, we've stopped using antibiotics now. Um, and we've not shown any increased risk of our endophthalmitis rates. So um, for, for, for fear of causing increased resistance and um, it, it, most patients just have um, just artificial teardrops are all that's needed to lubricate the eye um, uh, rather than an uh, actual antibiotic as such. Thank you. Um, one that refers to, to wet AMD, but some, well, some wet AMD patients don't benefit from anti treatment after a few years. Mm -hmm. So I think that question is about the sort of becoming resistant to the drug. Yeah. Is that yeah. the same for maculopathy patients? So definitely there is a there's a feeling that you can get this what's called tachyphylaxis where you don't respond to the drug as much anymore. Um, with maculopathy, with diabetes patients, certainly my the patients I treat, I don't tend to keep them on treatment quite as long because once they um, once the maculopathy has gone away with the antivirogens, I tend to stop the treatment and then um, restart it only if the patient gets a recurrence of the edema in the future. Um, we, I think there's less uh, evidence suggesting that the um, the attack of laxis in in diabetes, however. Um, it is true that if you start a new drug, so we, the likelihood is if, if the if the um, aflibiceptor stop working, then you're better off at changing over to a new drug. And it may be that furizumab um, or one of these other other agents would be better, or, or changing tack completely and start using a steroid. So there is certainly some patients that don't that stop responding to treatment or just don't respond uh, full stop. So there are certainly some patients have can have six injections of one treatment doesn't really do anything or the first injection might have worked and then after that nothing really changes then it's better you're better off changing to a different medication and see uh, another one might work better than sticking okay. with the same one thank you um and one that i've often wondered because i've seen different advice from different hospitals on what you should do after you've had an injection mm. um and this one i've seen everything as quoted here you shouldn't do your gardening you shouldn't wash your hair mm -hmm. and it's been a bit confusing when different hospitals have said different things about mm. what you should and shouldn't do after you've had an injection. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. I think you just have to be very sensible. I mean, it's, you don't want obviously increased risk of an infection. I mean, and so anything that like gardening, you know, potentially um, could, you know, if you get a bit of dirt in your eye, you're potentially in, in, introducing bacteria or fungus into the eye or, I mean, anything that, I, I think if you're sensible, if you, you can wear protective eyewear, if you, um, I wouldn't, I, I would say, You'd, it's, all, it's all hearsay really. there's no fixed rules and there haven't been any um, particular guidance from the college or anything but um, you know it, it probably does take about a week for the eye to recover completely from the injection and you just want to be sensible not to get anything um, any nasty bug potentially in the eye just yeah, I think I think it's usually swimming that you yeah. should really avoid. Yeah, yeah, swimming particularly because of the uh, there's bacteria and protozoa and all sort of things that live in swimming pools. So you just have to be a bit more careful. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us of that. Um, okay, there's a specific query from Richard that you can um, specific. I think he wants to have a word. Um, and no other general questions, Colin. Great. Okay. Well, perfect. Well, thank you very much. That's that. That's coming to a coming to a nice end. So, um, uh, so uh, Samantha, if you want to unshare your screen. Okay, uh, I will. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, oh, hang on. Uh, oh. Share. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that's been a really interesting, uh, interesting evening uh, talk again. Uh, so, thank you very much for coming, Samantha. Uh, Samantha, I do apologise uh, for the. Um,
the lack of chat. Uh, it, uh, Zoom have changed it and uh, it's not particularly screen reader friendly. So I was going round and round in circles and, and banging my head against the desk, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, so there we go. Uh, well, as, as always, this um, chat has been, um, has been recorded uh, and, and will be available on the Macular Society website in a uh, week or so. So if uh, you know anybody that didn't have the opportunity to come and join us uh, this evening live, they can watch it later. Uh, Jerry, is, is there anything that you that you'd like to add? Um, uh, this is the point where I usually talk about um, the chance to take part in clinical trials. Yes. Um, and to advertise the fact that we have um, what we call our research participant database. So that's a way that you can register with us that you might be in, interested in taking part in a clinical trial. Um, but not just clinical trials. We're always up being asked to. Um, support people who are carrying out um, other types of research like surveys um, so if you we people a lot of people want to know about your views of being a patient and about your views of potential treatments and support so do look out for adverts um, for that as well we have a particular page on our website where we advertise surveys that people might want it's another way of taking part in research and, and it's really um, a valued way of doing it not just being on a clinical trial um, the patient voice is very important in research. Um, so do look on our website for the part research participant database. And if I'm clever, I'll put the chat, I'll put the link in the chat function. Perfect, brilliant, thank you. Now, um, I need to tell you something because if I don't, uh, one of our fabulous volunteers, uh, Bernie, will absolutely murder me. Um, so as I get, we, we do have the Macular Society um, excellently facilitated by Bernie has a um, online to so virtual diabetic macular edema um, and, and retinopathy um, support group, um, which meets once a month at 7 p.m. over Zoom. So if you want any more information uh, about that, um, either contact me directly uh, uh, through, the, through the advice and information service, or just have a quick look on the old Macular Society website. Uh, and the information on how to join is is there. So there you go. I can live and breathe another day. That's marvellous. Um, so it just leads me to um, just say again that uh, the last the last Thursday of the month uh, is always our sort of working age um, sort of macular and me sessions. Next month uh, we've got Ability Net coming to join us and talking all things tech, which could should be quite a Quite a, a fun meeting, a fun session. Um, so, but yet look in the usual places for how they join the, the date and time and joining instructions and all of that. Um, so, it only leaves me just to thank uh, 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 Samantha Man again. So, thank you ever so much for, for joining us this evening and giving up some of your valuable time.